All right, welcome to another uh, edition copy episode of BizTech Twist with uh, CEO Simplex IT, Karachi Old Geek, Bob Compage. And I am joined today with an actual guest. Oh. <laughs> Kurt's actually one of the key members of the Simplex IT team. Kurt Ketchum, uh, thank you for joining us. Yay. Thanks for having me, Bob. Ah. Uh, and actually, your so your role over Simplex IT uh, handles a lot of the responsibility, both managing most of the projects with your team as well as the onboarding. Uh, but as far as today goes, uh, we really wanted to talk specifically about cloud because you handle most of the cloud migration or most of the cloud strategies, yep, right? That's me. Okay, I'm glad somebody does. But you won't let me do it. I. I just kind of surprised by that. It's on the whiteboard. Yeah. For, for those of you who aren't aware, there actually is a whiteboard at Simplex IT that has the uh, heading of things Bob is not allowed to touch. And that is because of the old part in Crotchety Old Geek. But I am an MCSE for Microsoft for 2000. It still counts just for you. <laughs> it, it does. It does. So anyway, but we wanted to talk about, uh, this is going to be an interesting topic, uh, cloud myths. And essentially, the reason this is going to be a little bit interesting is, is we're doing some research on this. And those of you who know, a lot of people uh, will talk to you about how you absolutely have to migrate to the cloud. It is the best thing there. And a lot of people are still saying you really should not go to the cloud because it's the worst thing there. And so we we're taking a look at doing a little bit of research on cloud myths. And it was interesting because we saw some very similar myths, but with people taking both sides of them. Uh, meaning that as we get into the topics, you should always do the cloud. You should never do the cloud. And both people basically talking about it as if it was the fait accompli. That was the way of doing it. And that's pretty much what we're going to talk about yep. as far as today goes. So um, any caveats or any kind of any regrets or anything? Always regrets when I do things with you. <laughs> How many years have you regretted this? Six. Six years. Yeah. Six years of regret. <laughs> well, we're shooting for seven, folks. So, again, keep in mind when we talk about cloud, what, 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 from your mindset, what's, what's the definition? When someone says cloud, what does that mean? Anything that's not your on-premises computers, your, your, your servers that are in a closet in the basement, collecting dust, uh, rotting away that haven't been touched in five or 10 years. Um, for me, the cloud is that freedom as a worker because I can take my work wherever I need to go. Um, and it's always available. It's resilient. Um, what does resilient mean in, in this context? Not susceptible, not susceptible to failure. With the exception of internet connection. Minor detail. Oh, yeah, that. <laughs> but actually, there are some strategies where you can actually even through synchronization or the like mm -hmm. have both an on-prem, off-prem yep. uh, strategy, uh, OneDrive for business, yep. for Microsoft, for, for example, or the like. Okay, so we're talking about a resilient, but resilient is really also dependent upon who's providing that, that resource in the cloud because they're going to tell you, oh, my God, it's the greatest thing. It's the most resilient thing, but is it? Yep. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about. Okay, so here's the fun part. Every person you talk to in the IT business is going to give you a slightly different definition of what the cloud is. And I want to be very clear here. I really don't care because really it's your implement implement or implementation. Yes. But if you can afford the T that makes it implementation, it'll go much smoother unless you're playing Scrabble. Uh, but your implementation for your organization, as far as the strategy, uh, that that is your cloud. So as we go through this, keep that in mind. So let's start with the first one. Cloud saves you money. Now, that was the big one back in the day, you know, about five, eight years ago, where they really first started pushing cloud as a true alternative. Everybody basically said, oh, it's, it's, it's going to save you money. What do you think about that? Have you seen our latest Azure bill, Bob? Yes. Yes, I have. Why do you think you've been penalized? I mean, invited to, to this great thing because you're costing me a lot of money. Minor detail. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
but we don't have the servers on prem anymore. Correct. So that's that offset. Right. But it's not necessarily cheaper, right? It's that total cost of ownership, right? To run servers in an office, right? Let's assume you actually need a server rack, switches, servers, uh, electricity, probably have battery backups, heating and cooling, probably lots of cooling just to make sure they don't overheat. Um, That costs a lot of upfront money. Um, That's where a lot of people spend a lot of their money uh, for those on-prem deployments. But to go to the cloud, um, it's not that capital expenditure anymore. It's that monthly spend. What are you spending each month uh, in the cloud to run those same services? So relatively speaking, we're talking about, and you bring up the whole idea of capital expense. And obviously, a CapEx line item is very different for a small organization than a large organization. But the bottom line is the difference between buying it and renting it. Yep. To a certain degree. And all of the things that you mentioned, you know, the, the rack space, the uh, UPS battery backups, all of those kind of things. Again, the details on that list might change, but the bottom line is you got to buy all this stuff versus you got to rent all this stuff. Yes. Cool. So I, 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 I'm, I'm still, are we saving money? You tell me, Bob, you write the check. <laughs> I'm just the IT guy. So, but here's one of the things that I think a lot of people fail to recognize is the fact that if you look at, even if you basically said the total cost of ownership was the same, and, and in some cases it's more, in some cases it's less, which is really what it gets down to, uh, the savings for the cloud is you don't have to make the capital investment. Right. So if you're sitting here with a, a an internal operation, with an on-prem operation that is working because your server's working, it's not obsolete, it's not out of date, you've got the rack, you've got the batteries, you've got all that stuff, it's there. And someone says you should move to the cloud when you don't have to replace any infrastructure. Is that a good move? It depends. Okay. It's the whole gray area, right? Okay. Um, so the concept of the cloud saving you money. Um. The cloud is all about workflows, your processes, right? If all you're doing is taking that same server rack that you have in your office and you just lift and shift it into your favorite cloud, Azure, AWS, Google, that's going to be expensive because you're running these virtual machines with a virtual network behind it, with virtual firewalls in front of it all. That's expensive, right? But if you change your processes, right, do you need a SQL server or can you just run a SQL database as a service? right? Your application that you're hosting, does it need a full Windows server running it? Or can it just run as a service, right? They, they typically divide it into infrastructure as a service, uh, platform as a service, and software as a service. And as you go from each tier, you know, from infrastructure to platform to, to software, the costing changes, right? Because you have less control as you go through that tier from an infrastructure standpoint. Um, You don't have to manage an individual VM, a server VM for the platform as a service, right? The cloud provider manages that for you. They they make sure it's running. They keep it patched and up to date. Uh, They take care of the security for it. Uh, They ensure that the hardware it's running on is is always available. And if it fails, to fail it over properly. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, Software as a service, it's just that. Uh, It's just the software. You don't have to worry about the back end that runs it. So your responsibility keeps going down. So that's where your cost savings can start to come into play. But it does require rethinking how you do things. Okay. So in other words, if I take my current organization, my current organization uh, basically has the traditional, I've got a server, I've got workstations who are running software that's running off of a server, all that kind of fun stuff. I could move that and have the exact same server, but running virtually and hosted virtually in the cloud. But that would essentially be the most expensive version of that server in the cloud to do so. And if I didn't have to replace it, if there was no real compelling reason to replace that server, it was only a couple of years old. The operating system was still supported by Microsoft. All of that, I'm not going to save any cap expense because I didn't need to expend any more capital. Right. And I already bought the, the bloody thing. Right. 
So by doing that kind of situation, you're almost guaranteeing it's going to be more expensive. Exactly. In the long run. Yeah. In the long run. Now, but you bring up an interesting point is that with the cloud, you can cut down, instead of running the whole server, I'm only going to run the pieces that I need. Correct. And that's more of a, a service. Yeah. What's the term that you're using? Platform as a Platform service. Platform as a service. So in other words, I don't need a server running SQL, which is the database yep. engine. I just need the database engine. Right. I don't need the uh, file structure for file shares and running under a server. I just need the file shares. Correct. So if I take the time to reinvent or to divide and conquer all of those things that the server is providing me to the organization, each one of those will cut down the operational cost a little bit. Correct. Cool. So the two things I'm hearing is, number one, the best time to evaluate whether or not how the servers go or or how the, the migration, whether it makes sense economically, is either A, when it's near time, and I would say three to six months oh, ahead of time, at least, at least. Yeah. Uh, three to six, at least three to six months before you would be replacing the server. Yep. Or something significant is happening to your organization where you're going to have to revisit whether it's it's expansion or acquisition, or you're going to be doing oh, what's this work from anywhere? I hear, you know, where you're going to start deploying uh, a sales force. Yep. Uh, across the area, so you need a lot more on a lot more accessibility to data or things. So those are kind of the two the two areas or the two times to really evaluate what whether or not you should be on prem or cloud based. Yep. Cool. So any other comments as far as this saves money? It's that gray area in between, right? You want it to save money, right? But to get there, you're going to have to go through the process and you. Know, a lot of companies, they start at infrastructure as a service because it's familiar, mm-hmm. right? Um, but yeah, it may cost more upfront, but it gives you a roadmap. It gives you a path to go down, uh, to work towards, to, to find that better option, the better solution that suits you, suits your growth, suits your checkbook, uh, fits the bill. So the bottom line is, is it's no longer a mythical, it's always going to be. You actually have to research it a little bit. Absolutely. And, and the other thing is, is that, you're not you're not stuck with it's an either or it can be a hybrid mm-hmm. cool second myth moving to the clouds easy live the dream bob i've been trying you're not making it easier for me to do this i'm sorry <laughs> yeah always trust apologies with a grin <laughs> so moving to the cloud is easy you, you almost lead me to believe that it isn't. I mean, what's going on here? Is anything easy? I mean, it, it's, <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, you're taking all your data, your processes, your procedures, your workflows, and you're trying to move them out of that server rack that's sitting in your basement that hasn't been touched in five or more years, right? And you're trying to move it into the, the cloud, you know, whatever you want to, however you want to define the cloud, right? And that can be as simple as, ah, oh, we're just going to move our email, right? From, you know, your exchange server 2013 or older, please don't do that. <laughs> um, into exchange online. Um, but it requires a lot of work, a lot of upfront work. Um, it, it's not the simplest thing to do. It's not just dragging and dropping, you know, emails into a new folder. You're, you're picking up uh, mailboxes for every user in your company and moving them from one location to another and changing how they work. Are you going to have to go through any software upgrades as, as a result? Um, you know, are you going from good old your uh, perpetual Microsoft Office uh, installations? Or are you going to Microsoft 365? Right, different licensing, different applications. You have to do all these different, uh, so many different things. Because um, it's not just the software, it's not just the data. It, it's the the back end for everything. Because at the end of the day, as an IT person, you don't want to create more downtime for your users than you have to. Right. And there's no easy button, unfortunately. There should be. But I think one of the things that often happens here is, is first of all, the, the dream migration is where there's an organization that really does two things. 
We've got exchange for our email and we do file shares. That's it. That's all the, the glorified file storage and all that. That organization, actually, the migration can be relatively simpler because there's not a lot of all the other things that you're talking about. And those are great because there's a lot of folks, uh, especially that are using the old small business server, God help yep. us all. Uh, the rest of you ask your parents, uh, you know, or using the old stuff and it's finally time for them to make the update. So it's really the more complexity you add to whatever it is you're running beyond that. We're running applications. We're running QuickBooks. We're running, I saw that face. Uh, you know, we're running uh, ERP systems or MRP. We do a lot of manufacturing folks, so we use a lot of buzzwords there. Uh, but whatever it is, or CAD drawings or designs uh, or anything. Yep. Uh, essentially, every application that you have above and beyond file shares and, and email runs the possible risk of creating a a more complicated migration path. Yep. Is that like a, a good rule of thumb to use? That's, that's a good one. Yes. I had a good one. I think I'm done for the year now. The other thing, though, is technical debt. Because this is the time you have to clean it up. Yes. All right. What's, what's your thought on tech? What is technical debt to you? Uh, for me, technical debt is that, you know, that's Windows Server 2008, Windows 7, workstations, uh, you know, the 100 gig mailbox because, you know, Tom in sales doesn't want to delete his emails from 15 years ago. Um, the software that hasn't been updated in 15 years and the vendor doesn't exist anymore. They went out of business. and But, you know, somebody, you know, down the street who has worked in it before right? Um, or your file shares that haven't been touched and you have all these old you know, users who are no longer with the company and you have old permissions out there and you don't know who has access to what. And the only thing you really are aware of in a lot of cases, and again, this is, I hate to say we've, we've said this many, many times in, in manufacturing, especially the definition of obsolete is it doesn't turn on anymore. Correct. And there's a lot of organizations, but it goes way, way, way beyond manufacturing where essentially it still works. Why mess with it? Well, you move to the cloud where the cloud is going to have certain requirements because they are by definition keeping up with the latest and greatest, which means your stuff has to work using the latest and greatest. You don't want to give up Windows 7? I don't want to give up Windows Bob. (laughs) Again, ask your parents. Um, But they have to. And one of the worst things to see is organizations who will try to go through these gyrations to try to make it. It'll just, I know we've only got a five pound bag and we've got eight pounds, but I can get those three additional pounds in there. And the worst situation is when they succeed. Yeah. Because usually it's a temporary success, right? Yeah. So you need to take an inventory of of the debt. Absolutely. And the debt can be, like you're talking about, it can be obsolete uh, equipment. It can be uh, unsupported software. It could be stuff that nobody knows how it was put together, but now it has to be put together again. And a lot of it can be business processes that are, well, of course we do it that way because, well, you know, that's the way we do it. And you have to be open to taking a look at that whole situation or it's not going to be pretty. Yep. Cool. And with that pretty comment, we're going to pause now. Don't let IT overwhelm you. Simplex IT's Learning Center provides easy-to-understand answers to your most commonly asked IT questions. Our videos cover both technical and non-technical topics. Everything from cybersecurity to cloud computing, managed services to co-managed services, and how easy it is to work with us. All so you can stay ahead of the game and maximize your IT. We have over 100 videos, so visit simplex-it.com today and look for our learning center. And not all videos have Bob in them. Hey, what? What? Simplify your complex IT with Simplex IT. And we're back because apparently we have more to talk about. So the next myth I want to go into is everything's backed up in the cloud. We don't have to worry about backups anymore. And that's got to be a relief. Uh-huh. You know, I... I <laughs> I almost think you're being sarcastic here. 
You don't say. (laughs) (laughs) So what is it about backups in the cloud? So a lot of cloud providers, their mantra is, it's your data. You're in charge of the data, right? We'll we'll keep the lights on for you, right? You know, they're the Motel 6, right? And keep the lights on for you. But it's your data. You're responsible for that data. Now, they'll give you the mechanisms for backing up that data, making sure that data is always there. But it's on you to configure it. But they clearly say that to you. So it's very, very obvious what you need to be back. You're giving me that look again. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> but you actually do bring up a good point. So what is the ve- the vendor's responsibility? And let's use Microsoft because, well, we use Microsoft. So Microsoft does have a responsibility to maintain accessibility to your data, right? Correct. So they do that by keeping it, keeping your data at multiple locations. Yep. That's essentially what they're doing, but it's the same data. It's, it's just a replication of the data. So if your data gets manipulated, so let's say, for example, uh, you get hit with a, with a uh, ransomware attack yep. and your data gets uh, encrypted or the like, Microsoft will be very, very efficient and effective to make sure that your data is encrypted across multiple data centers. Correct. Right. So the bottom line is you're you're still toast. Similarly, if you delete data from and again, I'm just sticking with 365, but uh, Azure and AWS and everybody else is pretty much the same. Uh, If you delete data, they will also delete your data because you deleted your data and they may have some retention policies or the like, but usually it's like within the 30 day range or so where beyond that you can't, you can't recover it. And someone who actually wanted to delete your data can actually remove that stuff as well. It's not that hard. So the bottom line is you don't have uh, actual backups that we would, well, certainly not that we would consider legal from a compliance standpoint or the like. There are requirements or uh, easily accessible or discoverable. If someone says we want to see all email uh, that involved this particular case or this particular keywords, you'll get a response that's, well, here's everything we have access to, but that's not necessarily everything. You got it. And that's where you have to rely on third parties to provide those backups. Yep. Depending on the, depending on what you're talking about. Um, Office 365, um, you're going to go down that third party route a lot, probably for uh, backup uh, and recovery. Um, and just to jump in here, when we talk 365, we're not just talking email. Correct. We're talking OneDrive for business, just OneDrive for business, not OneDrive personal. Thank you, Microsoft, for that. Uh, we're talking SharePoint online. We're talking Teams. Yep as well as all of the exchange uh, email all of stuff. It. Yep. Now, when you start talking Microsoft Azure, it's a little different. Microsoft has built out a lot of tools. Uh, depending okay, on- real quick, because I understand it perfectly. <laughs> okay. But I'm going to pretend like I don't. Azure versus 365. Um, Microsoft 365. It's a software as a service platform. Um, it is, you know, email, your hosted email, uh, hosted applications. It's a place for you to store your data. Right. That's what you're using. You're using, you're hosting your data there and you're using their software to access it. But your data using the tools, OneDrive for Business, SharePoint, Online, Teams. So the stuff we were talking about earlier, like a virtual server or SQL or anything along those lines, that's not 365. Correct. Okay. But 365 also, and this is where it gets, it's actually very convenient, but it's confusing when you start trying to figure out what's what, uh, is 365 also is a licensing model. So you can actually have the products, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Correct. like on your on your computer. You got it. As well as other, there, some people don't realize uh, with 365, you can get uh, Microsoft Project, Project Server, Project Online, uh, things along those lines yep. as well. So, okay. So back to the to the backup question. So we'll get the data all backed up with the 365, depending upon what third party we're using. Correct. What about Azure? Uh, Natively in Azure, Microsoft has a lot of tools. Uh, Depending on how you build your solution, Microsoft can back it up in some form. Um, But that's an additional service, more or less. It is an additional service. You're going to pay for it. Okay. Nothing's free. Not in the cloud. I got a t-shirt once. It was free. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, wait. I had to pay for the conference. Never mind. (laughs) Okay. So... But is it, all right, fine. So I got to pay for it. I got to pay for everything. 
is it secure? It's as secure as you make it. Okay, so I hear a term air gap used a lot when we talk about security. So let's talk about how backups actually work in Azure. Right? We'll talk about server backups. Okay. Right? Uh, let's say you're running that VM, that virtual machine. It could be a server, Windows 10, 11, take your pick. You can run your traditional backups on it with natively within Azure. You can back up once a day. Let's do your daily backups, weekly, monthly, yearly. When we say doing backups, yeah. you're not backing up. I got it on my tape drive. No, no, no. I want to bring out my tape drive. Your A track tape drive? <laughs> I've got a reel to reel. I bet you do. <laughs> so we're not backing up locally on premise. It's still in it's still in the cloud. It's on the cloud. Okay. And you know, keep in mind that when you start building out your Azure infrastructure, right? You have to pick an Azure region. Now, a lot of times an Azure region is actually three physical data centers that compose one single region, right? And when you deploy that VM and the data that's on it, it's actually replicated by default once at each of those locations. That's locally redundant uh, deployment for those. Uh, so that gets sources. back to the concept of they're going to make sure we have access exactly. to the data by having three data server Correct. sites, locations. Yes. Okay. Right. Then you can also con you can configure the uh, disaster recovery. So you can actually have it so-so, you know, that VM or multiple VMs are automatically replicated to another Azure region. So if, you know, that region is taken offline for whatever reason, you can automatically fail over to the other region. Usually these are across the country and other part of the world. Um, now from a backup standpoint, uh, your backups are backed up locally, right? So when you run those backup jobs are stored in that region, but you can have more backups stored in other regions, right? You can store them wherever you want. Now, as far as air gap backups in Azure, it's, you're still in Azure, right? Um, only you have access to those backups. They do have immutable backups. So once they're backed up, it's not changing. Um, yeah, but you have options. Right. So, but when we talk about from an air gap, air gap or air gap, either one, when we talk about an air gap standpoint, we're really talking about so that there are different credentials that are involved, right? Correct. Because one of the one of the things that happens, one of the most common ways for the bad guys to get in is credential theft, and IT people are just as prone, in some ways you could say more so, uh, to have their credentials stolen. So if the credentials that are stolen uh, include both the Azure data as well as the backups, well then the bad guys just oh we just have to remember to delete that too or encrypt that too. Right. The air gap would essentially make it so that the bad guys would need to have multiple sets of credentials Correct. stolen in order to get access to encrypt everything. Correct. And that's one of the say, and that's whether you have on-prem uh, infrastructure, cloud-based infrastructure, whatever, you should always, always, always have different credentials uh, required to uh, get access to your backup stuff. Ask your IT provider if they've got that in place, because that is significant. Uh, we have had companies that have reached out to us where it turned out everything was encrypted, uh, their backups as well as their on-prem stuff. And there's only so much you can do in that particular instance. So are there third-party backup solutions for Azure as well? There are, but your mileage is going to vary. Um, right. uh, one of the third-party provi providers we use, they do traditional Azure VMs. They'll back it up just like your ser on-prem server VMs. They'll back it up. And then it goes to their uh, chunk of Azure that they manage, mm -hmm. you know, air gap, so to speak. Um, but when you start talking to the platform as a service, software as a service stuff, that solution doesn't support those two options, right? So they can back up that server VM, but they can't necessarily back up the SQL database as a service or your application that you're running. So you're going to kind of have to, you know, do you want to go down that native Azure route of how they back, back stuff up and replicate stuff? Um, or do you want to see what other third party solutions are, are out there? Okay. I mean, your mileage may vary depending. And a lot of this gets down to that whole risk. Uh, you know, what's your risk tolerance, you know, risk being the likelihood of a particular event or particular disaster happening, uh, aligned with what would the damage be if it did. And the more, the higher your risk tolerance is, the less likely it is you're going to pay money or you don't have the money in the first place. Uh, to protect against that that issue, the less risk tolerance you have, <laughs> the bigger your budget's going to be for this stuff. Yep. So cool. All right. 
Cloud security, though, cloud security is easy, right? Because Microsoft has already set everything up. So uh-huh. you're secure. Absolutely. Good. That one's quick. <laughs> Wait a minute. Is it funny? Hey, yeah, you believe me. <laughs> cloud security. I mean, you see a lot of news about this um, over the past couple of years where, oh, my gosh, all this data was exposed because someone left this data store exposed to the Internet. Why, 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 why did they do that? It's not that easy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's that whole, you have to understand what you're doing when you, you d- deploy this stuff. Why do you see, why does it sound like you're saying that specifically to me that I have to know what I'm doing? Please see the whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it's, it, it's not to be condescending. It, 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 it's that, you know, you don't let a toddler drive a car. Um, cloud's kind of similar in that res- regard when it comes to security. Um, a lot of default settings are there to make things easy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, convenience and security don't go hand in hand. Um, and there's really two types of convenience, right? There's the convenience of the people who are managing, maintaining, and operating it. And then there's the convenience of the people who are trying to use it. Absolutely. And either one of those, the convenience can actually be taken advantage of by the bad guys. Absolutely. So if the, if the IT people who are, who are managing that infrastructure, if they don't set it up properly, they don't configure it appropriately as far as protection goes. Fine. The bad guys go in through the back door. They get into the server through a firewall opening or something like that. Boom, they go after it. And if the if the users have an easy way to get into the system and the like, well, the bad guys take advantage of that and are able to steal, uh, you know, end user credentials or the like. Absolutely. So it's it's on both sides that we have to worry about. Yeah, at the end user level, it's, you know, are you easiest thing in the world? Are you using MFA? For, for, for what your user accounts, you know, your end users accessing company data with some type of multi-factor authentication. That, that's going to stop a lot of headache for you as an IT person. And more and more that will make it so that a, a, an insurance provider will talk to you. Yes. Because more and more uh, cyber insurance companies are refusing unless your organization is using MFA. And they are, they are asking you to prove it or they will not pay off a uh, claim unless you can prove that it's actually used throughout your organization appropriately. Seeing more and more of that sort of stuff going on. Yep. I mean, and on the admin side of things, and this can be whether you're talking inside of Azure or Microsoft 365 administration, do your admins, you know, are they protected by uh, MFA? Are they, are you using some type of conditional access policy? Are you using uh, 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 role-based access? Uh, to, to grant access to different resources in the cloud. Like if you have multiple people working inside of your Azure subscriptions, right? Are they all owners? You know, that, that, that is the default role that you get when you spin up a subscription in Azure, the owner role, right? Mm-hmm. So that means you are a God inside of that subscription. So anything that you create. Finally, somewhere. No. <laughs> So that gets into a different version of the least privilege access. Yeah. We want whoever the user is, we only want them to be able to access the resources that they need in order right. to do their job and no more. Correct. And that's it, which really annoys the bejeebers out of some end users, especially CEOs. What do you mean I can't install my own software? Right. Absolutely. But it's kittens. <laughs> and they're cute. They're adorable. And when I install it, I just have to give it that application access to every aspect of my computer. What could be wrong with that? It's kittens. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Nothing's wrong. And part of the challenge, Joe, is that because remember we were saying earlier when we we're talking about the possibility of moving to a cloud is we were saying you want flexibility because we're distributing the employees throughout the country. Right. Well, that means we have to allow a lot more people to access these resources which means that it's going to be harder for us to, without some uh, work on our part, it's going to be harder for us to differentiate who the bad guys are versus right. who the good guys are. Right. Cool. So moving on. So the next one is, is cloud solutions. And, and yes, we're, we're reading from a list kind of here is that the cloud solutions fits everybody's budget and everybody's need. It, it is the answer to everything. Absolutely. Yes. What is it? A solution rich environment? Yeah. You like to say. Yep. Um, to cloud providers credit, 
they've given you a lot of options to do pretty much whatever you want. Maybe to a fault sometimes. Um, but yeah, like we started with the beginning of the conversation. That two-year-old server you just bought, I don't need to replace it yet. Right. Right. Um, I don't have a huge budget for IT. Right. So the beauty of the cloud is that it can be customized to fit what you want to do. As long as you have a big enough checkbook to cover the cost. Um, but it's not going to be for everybody. We have some small clients who they're okay with that little server that sits there because it's running QuickBooks for them. And that's all they need because to move it to the cloud, ridiculously expensive. And we also have companies who, again, I'm going to dwell on manufacturing, uh, where they've got equipment on the shop floor that re- that communicates directly with their server, with Absolutely. software. Mm-hmm. And it, in some cases, it's been written 10, 15 years ago, or the equipment right. was purchased 10, 15 years ago. It's still running fine. Right. So it would be a six-figure uh, investment for them to replace that. And for right. some reason, they don't want to spend that money. I don't know why. Or other good examples. Um Media firms, other good examples, uh, media companies, uh, engineering firms, right? You're working with CAD drawings, video files, audio files, right? If those are hosted, let's say in SharePoint Online or OneDrive for Business, um, or you know, pick your cloud file storage of choice, that's not going to work because you need to have, if you're trying to edit that stuff, uh, the latency is going to just stop you in your tracks. It's going to take forever to open the files, it's going to take forever to edit the files, it's going to take forever to save the files. Um, so you need to have those local file servers uh, in this instance. So you have to have some type of on-prem infrastructure. Uh, the cloud doesn't magically make it all go all the, all the way. You still have to have something. Um, I guess it's part of the beauty is, you know, you can do a hybrid cloud now where you, do, you have chunks of infra- infrastructure on-prem for things like your file storage or uh, application servers that need to work with low latency. Um, then you can still have your cloud components. A lot of companies probably are already hybrid uh, with the cloud and they just don't know it. Right. All right. You know, where's your email hosted at exchange online? You know, you have uh, your desktop documents and picture folders. They're backed up in one drive for business. You just don't even know it. Right. But it's still cached locally on your computer. That's how it seems so fast. Um, but yeah, you still have a SQL server and a thick app running in the, in the office because that's what you guys need right now. So, there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, so you don't have to dive 100% into the cloud right away. So it's often been said about humans, aside from they're just a bad idea. A little bit. Yeah. Um, we love choices. Mm-hmm. We hate decisions. Yep. So we want to have that flexibility or the like, but it's difficult for an organization sometimes to sit down and say, okay, here's the strategy we're going to use. And part of the reason is because it's whatever you decide, it's not going to be perfect. Correct. There's going to be scenarios where it is going to be more expensive for your organization. So one of the things I love to get back to is is that humans love to have options. Yep. But we hate to make decisions. And for organizations, no matter what you do, if you come up with a strategy, and that strategy is going to present itself, and we're used to the status quo, and the status quo may be incredibly ineffective or inefficient for certain situations, but it's the way we've been doing it. So we've kind of surrendered to that. But when you take a look at a cloud or a hybrid or a new on-prem situation, there's no question that there are going to be some circumstances or some situations where uh, the organization will be penalized Mm -hmm. because of that strategy. You went to the cloud, so it's going to be harder for you guys to be fully operational if you lose internet access. Right. Uh, you stayed on prem. It's going to be harder for you guys to be fully operational if your entire organization gets shut down because of extended power outage or fire or the like. Yep. Uh, you're going to do hybrid. It is now more expensive and a little more, you know, it, it, but that's, that happens, right? That's right. No matter what you do. And, and one of the things I think that this kind of gets back to pretty much a lot of things you're saying is your mileage may vary. Right depending upon your organization. So companies sitting there and they're basically saying, so what do I do? What's your advice to them? 
Besides contact simplex IT. Besides contact simplex IT. That should be that should be a given. For those of you who are just listening, I'm looking very sternly into the camera right now. Beyond that. I mean, obviously, you know, have us as the first speed dial you go to. Uh, after that, do your research, right? Research what you want to do. No, I mean, not just the products you're looking at moving to from a cloud perspective, mm-hmm. if you go that route, but know your business, right? Know how your users function. Uh, and from where? And where, right? Know your users. Okay. So so really, you could almost make the case of before you even go down the technical road, yeah. go down the business road. Absolutely. What do you people, what do your people need to do? Where do they do it? And what do they need access to in order to do it? Yep. And and don't be afraid to to say pie in the sky five years from now, I really want to be expanded. Mm-hmm. Because we've talked to companies who were sitting there and they had one salesperson in their office or two salespeople in their office. But then we ask them there, oh, yeah, we're trying to sell across the country. Yep. Well, why don't you have a salesperson on the West Coast, you know, who, who could be operating out of their own home? But with cloud, it's going to be so much easier to give them access to those resources. Absolutely. Cool. Other thing is keep in mind how old is the stuff you got? And this is not an attack on the old stuff. It's adorable. It's great. You know, we all have that Leonard Skinner shirt somewhere. Again, ask your parents. Um, But recognize the fact you cannot, from a security standpoint, from an operational standpoint, from a support standpoint, from a management standpoint, you cannot run technology into the ground the way you could 15, 20 years ago. Right. You know, the day of Windows XP and Server 2003 forever, those days are gone. And as an example, uh, Server 2012 R2. Yep. That's end of life in October. October. Of this year. It's coming. What does that mean? What happens? It means in October, Microsoft's going to stop publishing security updates. Uh, and that's all they're doing right now. So there's yeah. no feature updates. Uh, it's tougher to get support. Uh, but security updates, they could, they keep doing for now, for now, but until October of 2023, those listening in the future. Yes. Uh, and then it's gone. And then soon after that, you're going to see more and more security vendors who provide endpoint security, yes. backup vendors who provide backup application who are going to more and more drop their support. And also my suspicion is if you read your, if you have cyber insurance and if you don't contact Simplex IT, but if you uh, have cyber insurance, my suspicion is you're not going to be covered or it's going to be much more restrictive or you're paying a lot more money if you are operating any software that is not supported by the vendor. And for those of you running Server 2012 R2, you will fall into that category in October of this year. Yep. Now, the interesting thing is kind of wrapping up here is that when I went and I looked, you know, for, for uh, cloud myths, yep. I found a bunch of people who were, had these myths about how bad the cloud was. And they were saying, no, 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 it's really, really great. Yep. And I found these other podcasts or videos that were saying how great the cloud was. And they were saying, oh, really? no, it's really bad. To me, it gets back to the, when your favorite tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people in this business who will come to you and say, we have the perfect solution for your organization's problems. By the way, what are your organization's problems? Yep. You know, but you have to, you have to actually look into it with a more open mind. Right? Absolutely. I mean, the cloud is what you make it. Um, I don't want to implement a solution that doesn't work for you. That's obscenely expensive. That's not what I'm here for. Right. I want to make sure I'm helping your business move forward. Um, with the correct solution possible. Now, if that involves a cloud, great. If it doesn't, that's okay too. Um, but I want to help you do it and I want to do it responsibly. And I want to understand your business processes so that whatever we decide to do is helps you as a company. Cool. One of the best definitions of complexity that I ever heard was how many words does it take to describe it? And one of the things that you want to make sure whenever you're implementing any kind of solution for IT, it's as complex as it needs to be in order for your business to match and maintain the needs and opportunities for your clients and for your employees. 
And uh, the cloud is definitely a part of it. It's going to continue to be and become more and more so, but it's not the be end all and be all and end all for everybody. Any final words? I mean, I'm one of the biggest cloud advocates at our company. Seriously, he is. Oh, God. Um, but as much as I love the cloud, I also recognize um, it may not be the best situation or solution for everybody. So, you know, I, I want to put in the best solution for, uh, you know, whoever comes to us. Cool. And with that, we're going to wrap up another edition of BizTech Twists. I'm Bob Coppage, CEO, Crotchety O Geeks and Plex IT. And thank you, Kurt Ketchum, for uh, joining us today. And you know what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to like this and hit bells and subscribe and comment. And if you don't have any friends, find friends. If you do have friends, tell them about this. And uh, catch you next time.